and human rights law have developed as independent bodies of law. The development of this body law was not parallel. They developed as different bodies of law, uh, although they are clearly connected because uh, the goal, the general goal, is in most uh, cases uh, to protect human beings and prevent uh, unnecessary suffering, unnecessary violation of human beings. And uh, 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 in both cases, there is a, a basic principle of uh, humanity behind, uh, behind the, in one sense, is not giving rights necessarily in NHL, in the um, human rights is uh, giving rights to the individuals. But uh, uh, the reasons behind these two bodies of law are, uh, uh, in a way, as I was saying, more general in IHL, where it's just the basic principle of humanity that is behind all the humanization of uh, the law and the conflicts. And in uh, international human rights law is more uh, specific because it's the in identification of certain rights and the protection given on certain specific uh, rights. Um, why, why they develop differently, although they were recognized in a way, or could be recognized, as of the beginning of modern international law. Uh, you will uh, remember that one of the basic texts of international law is the, the famous uh, work of Grotius. Grotius wrote uh, his book, or better two books, uh, or a, a book divided in two parts. Uh, one, the law of war, and the second law of peace. So, uh, on the assumption that these were two different bodies of law. At the time, he didn't speak of human rights, of course. Human rights did not exist in international law, were uh, absorbed by sovereignty, and human rights were dealt only if, if they were dealt at the domestic level, but not at the international level. But, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this division dates back to all the old times. Uh, there is uh, in the development a temporal factor which affects the law because, uh, in a way, IHL preceded human rights law. Today we are used to, to in, uh, in the uh, academic uh, world, world uh, to speak of human rights more generally, and then we go to a specific part, a specific domain, which is IHL, humanitarian law. But in fact, uh, uh, human rights uh, um, law came much later at the international level. Um, if we go, go back, uh, uh, IHL started being what it is, to develop as it is, in the second part of the 19th century. I mean, you've heard all the, all the stories of the Battle of Soberino, the principle of humanity, the first uh, Geneva Convention, um, uh, the Red Cross uh, movement, and so on. But that was at that moment that the law started to develop in that direction, uh, with the Hague regulation, but not too much in terms of humanization, but there was something of that too and then with the Geneva Convention of 49. But uh, human rights law, international human rights law, starts much later. It starts, in fact, uh, after the Second World War, or during the Second World War. Before that, uh, there was no human rights law. It may be, appear strange today when we speak of human rights, but until that date, it didn't exist anything in terms of international law. Human rights was a matter for domestic law, not for international law. Was uh, uh, the constitutions made of states may contain, may have contained provisions to protect 
human rights of individuals against the power of the state. But there was nothing at the international level. I mean, the state was not entitled to discuss at the international level what happened in another state, how another state treated uh, its uh, citizens. Uh, unless they were citizens of the claimant state, of course, because in that case there could be a problem, an international problem. There was some idea, some small um, regulation here and there concerning minorities, but minorities again, frequently minorities are minority in country A and they are majority in country B. So there was some international connection. But otherwise, the individual was just exposed to the treatment he had in, in the state where, where he or she lived. Uh, humanitarian law uh, originated, by contrast, in the international context. Because war was, uh, by itself, an international phenomenon. The war is a war between two states. So in that context, the law uh, emerged. In the human rights law emerged at the domestic level and then was transferred much later to the international, uh, international uh, domain. And this also explains why uh, IHL uh, was essentially, initially concerned with international and non-domestic because the Mexican control remained within, we talked about that this morning, it remained within the south <coughs> of the state. It was for the state to the side. And it's true what uh, uh, my colleague said uh, this morning, that uh, there is a, always a resistance of states to recognize that there is another conflict. Because they prefer states to use uh, uh, domestic laws to deal with the phenomenon, and not international, uh, international law. Because international law deals also with domestic conflicts now, and uh, uh, states do not want that, essentially, don't like that. And we come to situations which is quite obvious that you have a, a, a non-international, uh, non-domestic conflict, armed conflict, and states still deny that that's a conflict. You, they may have the army going on the place of the conflict in the region where the conflict, and still deny that's a conflict. There's a conflict which often anybody, any observer, can would say this is another conflict inevitably. But states still say uh, say no. Uh, I know cases. I witness personally cases of states that uh, facing a self-evident non-international conflicts with part of their territory, gave, sent the army, <coughs> the regular army, but put the army under the control, the leadership of the Minister of Interior. And claiming this was just a police operation to fight against terrorism, but was not a conflict. Although you had the army on one side, non-armed, uh, person the other side uh, was a fight every day. I mean, but still, uh, the states uh, resist, uh, resist to that. In any case, where are we on this point? Because uh, we said at a certain moment, the two regimes, the two domains of law uh, emerged both after the Second World War and uh, um, continue to develop, nevertheless to some extent uh, separately, with little connection. Uh, that depended in part uh, probably on the expertise of people, because people became experts, academics, in human rights law or in IHL, but keeping the domain separately. In international organizations, you may have people dealing, sections dealing with human rights law and section with IHL. Uh, the United Nations itself 
did a lot of activity in human rights law. What did the UN on the HL? Very little. Very little. Left it to the Red Cross to do. I mean, the, the conventions, the Geneva Conventions, were convened on the initiative of the Swiss government and the Red Cross. They're not an uh, initiative of the United Nations after the war, but the human rights law emerged within the United Nations. The Universal Declaration is 48, but the Geneva Conventions, the UN had nothing to do with them. They made completely outside. So the, uh, there was a, a, for the UN, it may have uh, uh, contributed to that the idea, uh, which is reflected in the chapter, that war does not exist. War is not recognized as a legitimate means for settling international disputes. The Charter bans war to that effect, which does mean can ban war, in fact. But uh, it's not recognized as a legitimate means to resolve international disputes. Uh, so you will never find the word war in UN documents. It does not exist in war. It's, uh, it's not... Uh, uh, politically correct speak of war. You may say it's an armed conflict and an armed uh, confrontation or whatever, but the word war is not there. Um, uh, although we know that the war continues to exist. And uh, there was a reluctance in the regulation of war. So we leave that to other institutions. Uh, and uh, even the Geneva Conventions tried to introduce a sort of humanization of the world more than the conduct of hostilities as such. Although the rules are the false rules of conduct of hostilities, because you can humanize the world only if you conduct the hostilities in a certain way. So, but the, the focus was not regulating the war, because it was just to accept that there may be a war is a fact, and you try to humanize that war. But it's not regulating like Grotzio wanted to do, regulating the war. It's, it's, although you have to do it with rule, inevitably you have to do it in a different, in a different way. So, uh, there are similarities among the two fields of law, and uh, there are uh, differences because they evolved in a completely different uh, context. Uh, but it was a little bit it goes. It's also obvious that these fields could not remain separate indefinitely. At a certain moment, some connection had to be done. And uh, you find a number of clauses in the human rights instruments, in particular dealing with uh, situation of exception. Uh, Article 4 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, Article 15 of the uh, European Convention of Human Rights contain a clause that say, in case of war, the European Convention says war, uses the word, uh, the, the, the covenant does not use the word war, but says situations of exception uh, that may threaten the life of the nation. Of course, this includes also war. In fact, it includes war. And um, um, provide for a situation in which uh, rights in the legal instrument concerning human rights may be derogated from in time of war, in time of exception. But they stop there. They don't go beyond to say what, what you apply. Say, you can derogate from the rights to the extent necessary for, um, for uh, uh, facing the emergency that you are, uh, that you are facing. But uh, they stop there. So they take the human rights side don't go to regulate what happens and how 
the derogation, to what extent the derogation is possible and is legitimate, the derogation. They leave it open. But if you look at all the case law of the human rights bodies, well, they limit themselves again to that. Say, the state had a war, derogated from the rights, could derogate from the rights only <coughs> to the extent that it was necessary to face the emergency. If it was necessary, they stopped there. If you look at all the, the proceedings of the Human Rights Committee, you will find for 50 years at least, not, not 50 years, but until two, after 2005, so 30 years, you will not find anything on IHR. It was only later that uh, uh, it was felt that uh, uh, it was necessary to deal also what happened during the war. So in theory, the human rights body could also ask uh, and try to regulate uh, what happens during the war, would have a say on what happens during the war. And especially the um, International Court of Justice started to consider that the two fields of law couldn't continue to be unrelated completely. And you have uh, the, some uh, documents of the ICJ which are particularly uh, telling in this respect, uh, starting with the opinion, advisory opinion, on nuclear weapons. That goes back to 1996. In that uh, opinion, they speak of the Canada at a certain point, and I quote, I quote you the, the sentence, they say protection of the covenant of civil and political rights does not cease in times of war, except by the operation of Article 4 of the covenant, whereby certain provisions may be derogated from in a time of national emergency. That's the first affirmation that two fields are not separate completely. Because it's not that you apply in time of peace human rights law, in time of war IHL. The ICJ says the protection of human rights law, the covenant, does not cease in time of war. So, so you continue to apply it. Except, it says, by operation of Article 4, which allows for a derogation from the covenant to face an emergency. It's a first uh, recognition of the connection in law made by the, by the, main, uh, um, the main judicial body of the United Nations, as it is uh, referred to in, uh, uh, in the Charter. Uh, but, uh, but uh, it still keeps the two branches separate. Because they say human rights law continues to apply. <coughs> and you don't go to IHR. But if you make a derogation, then you apply a share in terms of war. So still is the old uh, uh, idea that you cannot apply both together. together. You have to apply one or the other. You do it through Article 4 of the Covenant because you cannot not apply the Covenant. The Covenant does not, does not say in time of war you apply a child, you don't apply the Covenant. So you have still to apply the Covenant, but if you derogate from the Covenant, then of course you pass to the other regime. But you know derogation is not automatic in case of war under the Covenant. The state that wants to derogate has to make a, a, an act of the state derogating, the act has to be notified to the Secretary General of the United Nations, and can be checked if it is legitimate, the derogation or not, can be checked by the Human Rights Committee on other bodies or anybody in the General Assembly or the United Nations as a state can challenge the legitimacy of a derogation from, uh, from the government. Another state party to the government may object to that derogation. So, it's not automatic. If you don't do it, you continue to apply, you, uh, continue to apply uh, human rights law. If you don't make the exception formally 
to the United Nations, we have to continue to apply to apply the law. Now, uh, but again, how far has human rights law to be applied if you make the derogation? Article 4 says you can derogate as far as it is necessary to face the emergency. Now, what does it mean? The state could say, well, to face the emergency, I have to bomb and do whatever to the other party, to the non-state actor, for instance. But is, is that enough? How, is, how much human rights law may, uh, may play? Is, are we still in a, in a, a perspective that uh, you have uh, a lex specialis, which would be IHL, that applies in the year of the Lex Generalis, that would be human rights law. This was the logic of process. Give the two box and say, when there is war, you apply war. When you apply war law, when you have peace, you apply peace law. Now we reduce the peace law to human rights, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, it's in general peace law that you apply. He didn't say what was more general, what was special. Grosses were clever enough to put them on the same, on the same level. Because uh, at the time, it was felt that recurring, resorting to law, to war, to resolve the dispute was legitimate. And was considered legitimate until the Second World War, in fact. You know that the Kaiser, after the First World War, there was an idea of indicting before the international court that was not set up later for uh, aggression. That would seem that war was not recognized, but it's not true, because on that occasion, the, the crime that was described to the, to the German guy was not having aggressed France. He could do that. Nobody would challenge that. But it was that he passed through Belgium to address France. And Belgium, in the London Conference of 1830, when the state of Belgium was created, the great powers of Europe agreed, all of them, on the neutrality of Belgium. So what he violated, the German Kaiser, was to attack France, where she was not protected because it was bordering a, a neutral state, but violated the principle of neutrality, that you can't attack a neutral country. So only that. It's not that aggression to France was not legitimate. Aggression to France would have been legitimate if Germany had attacked France directly. So the, the principle of, of, re, of resorting to war to resolve the dispute was not touched. It was the, the, the crime was the, the violation of the principle of a good faith of uh, uh, attacking a, a, neutral, a, neutral, a neutral country. Now, if you look at what uh, uh, I mentioned of the ICJ, it appears that uh, international human rights law has become the Lex Generalis. Why? Uh, because of the Charter of the UN that, that bans war. War, situation of war is specialist, and uh, the Lex, the IHL, would be Lex specialist as compared with the, with the general, uh, with the, in case there is a, in case there is a war and derogation article 4 from human rights law. But this approach, that's most traditional, was changed by the ICJ itself a few years later. And that is on the, uh, in the case uh, of the advisory opinion on the wall in Palestine, uh, where the court declared that both branches of law must be taken into account 
in some cases. They say, if you have a situation of war, including occupation, as the case of Palestine, you have to take into account, at the same time, the two branches of law. But in what sense? Again, the court same, seems to, to say that there is a sort of exclusive domain of the one or the other. Because it says some questions may be a matter for human rights law in war, some questions may be a matter for IHL exclusively. So when you apply one, you don't apply the other. When you apply the other, you don't apply the first one. So it's still, it's, it's put not like a situation of lex generalis, lex specialis. They are more certain, but still they are exclusive. The two fields are exclusive. When you apply one, you can't apply the other one. That's the, the position the, of the I, of the IC, uh, uh, ICJ. Uh, so that it's always, you abandon the principle of speciality, but you, if you have a context of war, you look at the situation, and to some situations you apply, uh, in some respects you apply human rights law, in other respects you have to apply, uh, you have to apply um, uh, international humanitarian law. So, uh, but exclusively. You don't apply jointly the two systems. Uh, so they do away with the principle of speciality, but it remains the problem that two fields exclude each other. One excludes the other one, depending on uh, the item that you, uh, that you are uh, considering, and taking into account, uh, especially. Uh, depending on the derogations that are made on human rights uh, law. Now, how can we go beyond that approach? Are we still in a situation in which the two fields are excluding each other? Or should we try to go a bit, a bit further to that? It's not easy, because as I said, the two fields of law are regarded as being uh, <coughs> separate, as being excluding uh, themselves, either by speciality or by the principle of uh, But I think one can, has to look uh, at the practice. But let's look a moment at the human rights approach, because uh, we have the approach of IHL, uh, what is the approach of human rights bodies to all go in the sense of the ICJ or they propose different solutions? You know, the ICJ in a way is the more neutral body because it has to deal with situations that may lead to apply one system or the other or not. But uh, a human rights body would tend to support uh, the application of human rights law instead of the instead of IHL. So we try to expand human rights law, and uh, by trying to do that, uh, the Human Rights Committee and uh, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, came uh, in 2004. So after the the wall to a, or concurrently with the world, it came to a, a, a conclusion that uh, I quote to you. The Human Rights Committee says in this uh, general comment on Article 4, these general comments of the Human Rights Committee are comments on specific articles trying to explain the practice and interpretation of that provision of the committee. On that, uh, on Article 4, says the committee, the covenant applies also in situations of armed conflict to which the rules of IHL are applicable. So it says, 
the covenant, so human rights law, applies also to situation in which you apply a child, because of course this is a war. The situation, the uh, the IHL is applicable, <coughs> and then continue saying why, in respect of certain common rights, more specific rules of IHL may be specially relevant for purposes of the interpretation of common rights. Both spheres of law are complementary, not mutually exclusive. So what do you uh, unquote? So what the Human Rights Committee says, in, co in contrast with the ICJ, the two fields of law are not excluding each other. <coughs> they are complementary and they are applicable simultaneously. It's not that you value the one or the other. And uh, says that uh, in respect of certain covenant rights, more specific rules of IHL may be specially relevant for purposes of interpretation of common rights. So it says, well, you can take into account IHL, but that IHL you take into account to apply human rights law, in fact. So human rights law is law applicable, always, but you may take into account IHL to interpret human rights law. Yeah. Does this presuppose uh, that a notice of derogation is in place? Uh, it does not say in that paragraph. But presumably, as the comment, the general comment is under Article 4, presumably it considers that the derogation is there, because otherwise Article 4 does not apply itself without the derogation to be I'm thinking of a particular judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, but... Uh... Yeah, we can discuss that. Uh, yeah. uh, what does this, uh, does war mean under Article 4? Uh, Naya, Kanaya, or Ayak? Uh, that, that again it does not say. Could be a, an Ayak or an Ayak. Could be both. Could be both. And in fact, uh, in terms of relationship between human rights law and IHL, it does not matter that much. Because IHL could be IHL of NIAC or uh, IAC. So it does not matter much. The, the problem is the same. I mean, in one case or the other, I think it is what the, the Human Rights Committee takes, at least. But it's interesting that the committee says, well, we apply only human rights law in such situation, but for interpreting human rights law, we may need IHL, which uh, is a different way of putting the question uh, uh, in which, uh, if you do that, uh, you have a situation where you apply one body of law, but that means that the other body of law you use for interpreting the first body of law, and you don't apply it as law. You apply it as a sort of fact on which that you use to interpret the law that you apply, which maybe goes a bit too far, because uh, IHL is, is the body of laws, after all. It's not just facts, the whole situation of fact. But uh, how? One thing one can try to do, and that the committee doesn't do, how do you apply it simultaneously the two? Because the test is that. I mean, the idea may be good, but what to do in a concrete case? What do you apply? And that, if you look at the two bodies of law, um, how can you apply international human rights law taking into account IHL? First, you may have provisions in human rights law which are <coughs> absolute. That would not allow any limitation under human rights law, and of course would not allow any derogation. Under Article 4 of the Covenant, you can derogate all the rights. 
some rights are indicated in that. So that rights you cannot derogate even in time of war. But to the extent that they are protected, of course. Here there's always been a, a sort of misunderstanding that non derogable rights are absolute rights. And that's not true. A right may be an indelible and be subject to limitations, nevertheless. I mean, the absolute right is a right that spelled out in a way that you cannot do anything against that right. For instance, you have torture, freedom from torture. That's the right. Under human rights law, you cannot introduce derogations to that. You may have a situation of emergency, you can face the situation derogating from the right not to be tortured. Because the right is spelled out in the Covenant Article 7 saying no one can be subjected to torture, full stop, or degrading treatment and, uh, and full stop. That's it. There is no possibility of limiting the right. If you have the right to freedom of expression, for instance, the covenant would say everybody is entitled to freedom of expression, and that would say uh, that right can be limited only for purposes of national security, morals, uh, and so on. I mean, there are a number of reasons where you can attenuate the right, with limit the right, restrict the right, without <coughs> cancelling it, of course. Yes? Thank you. Yeah, now going back to your example regarding torture, yeah. um, we have seen uh, at one point the United States endorsing this uh, uh, strengthened um, uh, interviewing techniques, um, uh, yeah. which uh, for many people in our field actually amounted to, may have amounted to torture. Um, uh, and yeah, just a comment on how dangerous uh, this kind of practice is. And this was made on the ground that uh, the, um, the situation of uh, the country and the threats on the country required so. So there is also a concerning practice by some of the states. Um, yeah, but that's clearly uh, against the covenant. Because you cannot derogate. The covenant is without, uh, uh, it's clear. I mean, torture is not allowed in any situation. You can derogate, it's absolute and indelible. Article 4 says it's indelible in case of emergency. So you can attenuate the right. It's, it's not possible. I mean, if you do, it's a violation. Of course, there are violations. But that's it's the same in the convention. Yeah. Hmm? It's the same for the convention. It's the same. Yeah, the right not to be tortured is an absolute right. But it's an absolute right both under human rights law and under IHM. Because if you look at Geneva Conventions, torture is banned. Yeah. It's not accepted, torture. Uh, there is the Convention Against Torture, which, however, is a bit partial. It's not really, uh, uh, does not take the problem fully, the 84 Convention on Torture. But if you take the main documents, torture is clearly a, a, a right not to be tortured that uh, is protected both under uh, human rights law and under IHI. That's clear. And of course, if that is the case, it doesn't matter which one you apply, because in the end, the law is the same. So when you have an absolute right which is protected in, by human rights law and is protected equally by IHL, is a no problem. <coughs> In fact, you may discuss if you play the one or you play the other, but if it's the same, you don't have, uh, you don't have uh, a, 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 a problem. You may say you apply HL, or you may say apply human rights law, does not change. Uh, you can say you apply human rights law, that human rights law is valid also in wartime, because HL is the same. So, uh, But take, uh, uh, say, let aside the, the Convention of 84. The Convention of 84 protects 
Again, stops are only in a limited way because it says that uh, torture under the convention is torture committed by a public official. So if torture is not committed by a public official, you have a problem. It's not protected under the convention. You can have to go back to the government. The government regulates any case of torture. And in a, in a comment of the Human Rights Committee on Article 7, it is said, even committed by private people. So it's, it's clear, the interpretation of, of, the, of the covenant. But you see immediately the problem with, uh, with, uh, uh, with Nayak, because uh, the Geneva Convention prohibits torture. But if you apply the 84 Convention, but the Geneva Convention refer only to international conflicts, although our common Article 3 contains the prohibition of torture. But uh, uh, you have the problem if you have a case, because common Article 3, the violation of common Article 3, are not included in the regime of the grave breaches. So if you commit a torture, violating Article 3, in principle, you may violate the prohibition, but you don't have a crime if you're committed by a non-state actor. Under the Convention of 84, you would not have a violation. So it's, uh, there are some problems to, to resolve in this regard. But set aside the Convention. The Convention has only one purpose. It was to allow forms of uh, control of the Committee Against Torture over places of detention, over prisons, and allow the Committee to go to visit prisons in the country. So clear that there, the, for the purpose of the Convention, it, it was uh, uh, important to deal with torture committed by public officials, not by private, because in, uh, in prisons you don't have private individuals to commit. They commit torture, it's normally the, the guards the, the, that uh, they commit the torture. But uh, let's uh, come to another point. If you have a right which is not absolute, what do you do? Because if you have an absolute right that's protected in two fields of law, you don't have a problem in reality. You apply IHL or you apply human rights law, but they are the same. But uh, take rights that are not absolute. What do you apply? Because restrictions, you may beg restrictions to these rights for national security, uh, protecting rights of others, uh, morals. Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech, freedom of association. Almost all the rights are not absolute. Are so, only some rights are absolute. It's not just one. Uh, the, the, the right to be recognized as a person, as an individual, uh, this is an absolute right. But there are very few rights that are, uh, that where you cannot bring uh, uh, restrictions. So. What is the problem in this case, to apply human rights law in this case? Is to inter and here understand what the Human Rights Committee wanted to say in this, in this approach. Says we have to interpret a, a provision which says that you can limit the right, restrict the right, for national security, for instance. Emergency. Uh, if you do it, it's not an even question to using Article 4. You have a situation of war. The threshold of national security is different than in time of peace. And if you have a different threshold, you look at that threshold using a different threshold to restrict the right. You are entitled, the state is entitled to restrict the rights for national security, for instance. Well, if this threshold is one, you restrict the right to one. <coughs> Make it 
limitation, but if the threshold goes up at five, you restrict the right more. That's what state do. You have a situation of terror or attacks like in Asia yesterday, you restrict the right of movement the more than if nothing happens. You let the people go circulate, talk, uh, make uh, groups uh, uh, together to discuss. If nothing happens around, you, you allow that thing. But if you have a situation in which there is emergency, you still apply the rule that says you can restrict for reasons of national security. The rule is the same, but you change the threshold. And so you can still apply human rights law. In fact, simply changing the, the situation, uh, the context in which you operate. You operate in a constant peace of calm and you don't restrict the right or restrict it very little. In, if you have a situation in which uh, you have an emergency, you restrict the right more, but you still remain within the provision. You don't derogate from the right. You are just applying the restriction clause at different, at different levels. And that's what, that, uh, um, what they, they want to say. But is that if only a factual thing? Or is where you need also IHL. The committee says it very, very shortly in that sentence. But uh, is uh, is that you change the threshold only because uh, <coughs> uh, there is factually a war, so you have uh, a, a different threshold of protection, and you reduce the protection of certain rights within what uh, human rights law says. Or you need to go to the law that would regulate that situation to decide if the restriction is legitimate. Because it's easy to say there is an emergency, the threshold is higher of danger, and I restrict the right. But to what extent is what is requested by IHL? You do it not more than what the IHL would require. Can you say I bring the restriction to a point which violates IHL or not? Because uh, if, uh, if you go to that, you regulate the war violating IHL, in fact. You say I apply human rights law. I don't take into account IHL. I use the word just as a fact to increase the threshold of uh, uh, restriction of the rights, and IHL is set aside. Or you simply say, well, I can change the threshold, but I have to do it in conformity. Because the, this raising of threshold cannot be arbitrary. And what means arbitrary? Arbitrary means first, it must be, the Human Rights Committee says that, arbitrary means it can be against the law first. Provided that the law is respectful of certain principles, of course. That's not an illegal law. But if you apply customary AHL, it's certainly not illegal. And uh, if you respect the IHL, you remain within what is required by the situation of war. So the, the, the idea of the Human Rights Committee, and I tend to say they, they have a point, maybe it's not uh, written uh, uh, fully, but uh, in, in the text that they provided for, because probably because they are not fully experts of, of IHL, but is that you use IHL to work on this threshold. When you have an absolute right, you have to apply the right. But if the right is a right which is uh, subjected to restrictions, to limitations, you can vary these limitations according to a, 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 a parameter, which is the parameter given by a child. Because in that situation, there is war, you have to apply the limits provided by the church. So you cannot go beyond those. 
the, the strings, you must be compatible with the HIA. And that's where you use the HIA. It's a vision which is from the humanized point of view, but in fact uh, allows to put uh, the two systems more or less together and workable together in a given in a given situation. So I think it's a very interesting attempt. It does not resolve necessarily the problem, but uh, uh, you take, for instance, for instance, right to life. Right to life is an unerable right, but it's not an absolute right. It's not absolute right, because if you read the Covenant, Article 6, it says no one uh, says everybody has an inherent right to life. No one can be deprived arbitrarily of life. That's a clear restriction of the right, because that means you can deprive people of life. It's not like torture. You can deprive a person of life if this is not arbitrary. For instance, you can include the use of firearms by the police that may like, lead in certain cases to deprivation of life, but it should not be arbitrary. And arbitrary means there should be a law, first, a protection of the law, and that the law must conform to certain principles. It's not saying a blank license to kill, of course, to the, to the police. So uh, this is a, a, a clear indication. What happens in war? One of the basic freedoms in war is to kill the enemy. So to deprive the enemy from right to life is clear. Now, I am it's limits to that. You can't deprive civilians of the right. You have to attack military. You have to attack military targets. You may have a collateral damage, but the collateral damage must be a subject to the principle of proportionality. proportionality. If that's not respect to proportionality, it's a violation. So uh, if you put it from the human rights point of view, you still apply human rights law on the right to life. And you play on this arbitrarily. And the, the arbitrary deprivation of life in case of war, not in case of the police, but in case of war, depends on IHL, on the limits put by IHL. So within the limits provided for by IHL, you can kill. But within those limits, it's not that you can reduce the the protection, uh, lower the protection and reduce it uh, beyond a certain, uh, certain limit. So it may, it may work if you have a non deliverable and the right to life is a specific right which is protected, but is protecting war, is protecting human rights, but it's not protected fully. <laughs> so the threshold must be in conformity with the two laws in case of war. Yes, sir, I have many places. Um, just a brief remark, if I may. Article 15, paragraph 2 yeah. of the European Convention on Human Rights actually makes an exception for legitimate acts of war. Yeah. If the covenant does not say. The covenant does not say, but, but you can, you can interpret it, it the same way. It's explicit in the European Convention. Yeah, it's, it's written explicitly, yeah. Mm -hmm. That you can legitimate act of war. Yeah. Can anyone say that if a one uh, breaches uh, uh, IHL, then that is also automatically a human rights violation in your example, the latest one? If one violates, uh, uh, well, you have, uh, there is one point that you have to take. <coughs> you mean a state or, uh, because that's the problem. I mean, human rights law is based on the responsibility of states, not the responsibility of individuals while IHL has both. has the responsibility of states, of course, for the conduct of hostilities, but it entails also the responsibility of individuals for violating the rules. Uh, that's a, a big step forward that has been made by the Geneva Conventions, actually. The Geneva Conventions uh, are convention for states, clearly. States are obliged to respect 
but they are also obliged to introduce in their system, uh, criminal system, uh, criminal rules for the repression of the great breaches. And this concerns individuals and not, uh, <coughs> uh, and not, and not states as such. The conduct of the states is to introduce the repressive system, but nothing more. I mean, in that respect, and to, and to implement it, of course, to introduce the system in the law and to, and to implement it. Uh, so I would say that uh, in that respect, a violation of IHL is, uh, from the point of view of the state, is illegitimate and may be considered illegitimate under human rights law if uh, the violation uh, is reflected also in human rights law because the, uh, it would be an average deprivation of life, for instance. So it could be taken from both points, IHL for, and for individuals, it's just IHL, of course, that applies inevitably. Because human rights law is only monitoring the conduct of states and not the conduct of individuals. It's, it's, left, it's left open. Human rights law does not deal with that. Of course, the monitoring bodies say, for instance, to states, you have to introduce the crime of torture if you don't have it. But a sort of preventive measure is not uh, <coughs> It's not mandatory. If a state succeeds in avoiding or preventing 100% torture from the territory without a criminal law, well, what's the problem? Nobody could challenge that. So it's true that the Human Rights Committee frequently to delegations that come say they don't have the crime of torture say you should put it in your legislation as a measure of preventive, of prevention, because it helps. But if a state could answer, listen, we have a laws that prevent from happening, and indeed it never happens. The Human Rights Committee could have anything to say, because the obligation of the state is to avoid, to prevent torture. If torture does not occur, the state is okay. How it does it? Article 2 of the Covenant would say to implement according to your system, to your constitutional system and legal system. So if one has a way of doing it without criminal activity, without criminal repression, it's a result that counts. It's not, uh, there is no obligation in the Covenant to introduce a criminal, a criminal sanction. It's not written anywhere. So the state could, uh, could not do it. If, if it achieves the result of protecting the right, that's, that's the only thing that the human rights law wants. But, uh, but from the uh, a state that does not have the crime for time of war, because that's the point, would be in violation of each other, no doubt. So there is still a, an area that remains separate from human rights in any event. Even if you try to interpret it, you know, uh, to find the applicability of the rules in both, in both cases, there is some aspects for which the two fields <coughs> remain to a certain extent uh, separate. But that was just to, to discuss the problem, I mean, because this is a huge problem how human rights law to a large extent uh, is based on misunderstandings. And that's because the specialists, the experts, are experts in one field and not in the other field. And as you may imagine, as human, each uh, side, each loop, tend to keep the domain of interest. This is our method. This is not your matter. You know that, for instance, there is this initiative of the CLC or of the <coughs> Swiss government to have a monitoring system of uh, violation of IHL. Because there is no monitoring system, actually. And what the initiative <coughs> was, was, say it's been uh, not, you heard yesterday from Madame Verdi, has not been accepted at the conference but maybe we'll take it up again. But in substance, what it is the system? It's a reporting system. States have to report 
through the human rights council uh, or another body on how they apply their land. That's exactly what the human rights system. They have to report uh, to the human rights committee other bodies on how they apply the Convention of Human Rights. It's exactly the same system. And uh, why not merging the two and having a common supervision? But the human rights people say, no, no, no we keep our system. The IHL the people say, we keep our system. I mean, then we have to do separately. Because in a way, both are right because you don't find many experts in both systems. That's the problem. That's the real problem. I mean, so you, how you compose the expert bodies to monitor if you have people that are expert in one and not in the other? But yes. in the human rights, there are monitoring systems. Mm -hmm. In the human rights, there are monitoring systems. All the convention, the UN Convention of Human Rights, have a monitoring system based on reports. It's also individual communications, but based, the basis is reports, state reports, and the committee that uh, discusses the reports and make recommendations to, uh, to change this or to change that in implementation. So the, the attempt now is to have a parallel system of reporting concerning IHR. Why keeping them separate? In light of these connections that we have, shouldn't it be better to have them together? But first, you have to form people that work in both sales. Because otherwise, it doesn't work clearly. It couldn't work. You don't have the expertise, the necessary expertise in the field. So in the, for the two fields, uh, you will need people that have uh, a quite a, a strong experience whether academic or practical, in both fields of law. But there are very few. There are very few that, uh, that deal with that. I mean, so it's, um, it may be problematic mm -hmm. to, to have a, a joint. I would think, I mean, when we discussed that, I told my friends of the CIC, mm -hmm. uh, well, I accept to have this. I'm fine having <coughs> a different system. But in the long run, they should get together. We can't go for everybody having two systems, separate systems, because the connections are too strong now, mm -hmm. especially with the non-international conflicts where the separation of the two systems is less, less clear. Yes? But am I wrong? I'm asking questions to the various colleagues who are human rights officers within the UN nations that actually they also have to do with IHL violation and they do report them to UNOHCHR, which is a super long, <laughs> yeah. So I'm asking them if this is actually already the reality on the field, that they might already have a certain... States? Thing. States do not report. Ah, this is, will be only for states, but... But a reporting system must be of states. But yeah. I understood that there was Maybe I'm wrong. I understood that there was a sort of uh, um, some, uh, it was seen as something a little bit difficult to implement by HR um, bodies or monitoring system like the UN Office for Human Rights or others. The fact of joining the two. You understood wrong? The, the difficulty is to find the experts in both fields. If you have the one body. The, the, the committee of experts that, that monitors that monitors uh, the the reports, <laughs> the discussions, the reports. You, you need people that that know both systems. Otherwise, it doesn't work. One system. Yeah. You see, that's why the ICRC tends to have. Let's put start with a with a system where whereby states report to a monitoring body that at the beginning will be just a political body and might become an expert body on, on, on IHF. On. States already report on human rights because the human rights system is based on the reports of states to, to expert bodies, actually, essentially independent bodies. But uh, wouldn't state report to ICRC, violations of IHF? 
report to? To the CRC. Mm -hmm. I mean, but they will not do it. They will not do it. I mean, the, it could be the ICRC, but I don't think the ICRC would invest uh, the body to do that, uh, that uh, monitoring. <coughs> because the ICRC has certain rules. Cannot come discussing a report of state A and tell you are not respecting human rights law. You are uh, IHI. They don't do it. They would do it uh, uh, in a, they do it actually, but not uh, publicly. Because if they start saying you are misbehaving, they take the part maybe of one of the belligerents or so, and, they, and all the purpose of the CLC will be, will not be, will be vanished probably. Yeah, we want to add some to Next one, oh, sir. Sorry. Exactly concerning the uh, responsibility of the status in the domain of uh, human rights violation, you said that uh, uh, state responsibility can be engaged. So, uh, which kind of sanction or punishment or responsibility can be taken against uh, states? Well, the monitoring bodies in the system, UN system are allowed only to make uh, recommendations states, which are not necessarily binding, but uh, can be done in a way that's almost binding, in the sense that uh, may draw the attention of the international community on state X that's violating, uh, that's violating the, the covenant on uh, human rights instrument. So it's not a, a real sanction, but there is some moral sanction in any way that may put the state in difficulty, depending on the of the situation of the state. But there is nothing more than that, actually. Uh, yeah, so there's a question. Uh, so what you were saying before was that human rights law applies only to state parties, to yeah. human rights treaties. So in a case of a non-international conflict where non-state actors have control over parts of a territory, there is no legal basis for conferring human rights obligations on those non-state actors. Only IHL obligations. Well, that's one of the uh, that's one of the problems. I mean, uh, states they do not control a part of the territory uh, may have an excuse. May I don't say they. It depends how much they are involved, or not in the in the in the area. Um, and uh, in any case, they have this part of the territory, they have to do all of what they can. And they don't do it normally, so it's also a, a sort of violation. That, I mean, but um, uh, one of the issues is to reach uh, the, the, the non-state actors, actually, and uh, that's one of the big issues, uh, both for uh, human rights and IHL. Uh, because, uh, uh, you see, the non-state actors tend to say that the obligations are just for the state. Mm -hmm. And they don't have any obligations under IHI, for instance. I mean, uh, uh, can I quote a case? I don't know if there's anybody coming from Colombia. Yeah. No, OK. Uh, not me. But Colombia, as you know, had a long war. The long uh, should be finished now, but, well, almost finished. I don't know engaged if it's finished, not not finished, because you know, when the, the conflict starts and ends, it's very difficult to know, and we discussed it this morning a bit. Uh, but in any case, Colombia has this long war, regular forces and the FARC. Now, uh, one of the debates between the state and the fact for coming to an end of this, finding a closing of this, depends on what you do with the violations that occur, both sides. And of course, the public officers of the state, soldiers or commanders, they are responsible, clear. Because there are clear obligations, they violate the racial or human rights law, and they have to respond to that. There is no doubt. 
Nobody would dispute that this is the case. But the others say, we, we are not obliged to respect the HL because the HL is for the state. And so, if you violated HL, we are not responsible. Of course, if they killed somebody, they may be responsible for murder under common law, the common law of the state. But they may have uh, a legitimate uh, reasons to protect others or whatever, depending. But it would be not be a HL that's applied. It would be criminal law, common criminal law. And uh, of course, uh, the, the, the military, the official military, says, well, come on, you are going to punish us and you don't do anything to them. <coughs> so the law to close uh, the, the, the question was very difficult to take. At the end, Colombia took a law to punish everybody, but with lenient sentences. So de facto, is, well, I think it's maximum six years, and if you take the time to make the trials and so on, at the end will be, it will be too little, actually. It will be almost an amnesty. So the, the amnesty they would accept. But it's difficult to make amnesties because uh, it's not a good basis for reconciliation, the amnesty. Uh, but one of the issues is exactly that, the state actors, because they, uh, if you take the conventions, the Geneva Convention not only speaks of the state actors. Uh, at the time, it was not probably a problem that was considered seriously. Although there had been domestic context for the end of the war, there were civil wars uh, in, in some countries, so that was a domestic one. So was that because Colombia did not ratify Protocol 2, or how could the non-state actors say that they are not uh, in breach of IHR? It's not ratified by Colombia, I think. There is a problem for the because they had a conflict, so they did not ratify the Protocol. You would have to explain to FARC or whoever that they would be, bound, would be bound to protocol number two by virtue of the Colombian ratification. I mean, they would have been bound by virtue. Of not only, not only, but you have to recognize in protocol two, in any event, there is no criminal sanction for anybody. Because the Great Bridges regime, that is the Geneva Convention of 49, is also in protocol one. But in Protocol 2, there is no regime. So you can't, on the basis of the protocol, criminal, criminal, there is the obligation to follow certain rules, but no criminal sanctions under the, under the protocol. The protocol does not take up the regime of grave breaches. It was suggested during the debate, but uh, at the conference, but it was said, I think it was Norway and another Nordic countries, I think, that proposed to introduce a regime of grave breaches in Protocol 2, and the conference said no. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, uh, you had something? Yeah, yes. yes. And then. I, I wanted to seek your opinion, sir, on the issue of torture. On the issue of? Torture. 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 Now it's explicitly clear that it is only in IHL that the issue of torture is banned. Yeah. And that is because combatants are not supposed to be tortured to reveal information concerning their forces and future plans. However, this law has... I don't think this is the reason. Yes. The reason is that the treatment cannot be accepted. Cannot be accepted. Not How? because uh, they are not allowed to give information. When you capture combatants, you can ask them only three or four questions. Mm. Their name, their number, mm. and mm. their unit. That is all. That's all they would like to tell you. Which means you can't ask them for any other thing. Sure. Now, the issue of torture has crept into domestic law. There is a dilemma between the responsibility of the state and the freedom of the citizen. The state has a responsibility to protect everybody, including violent crimes and extremist hate crimes. Now, the security agencies working for the state 
apprehend people in extremist organizations or criminal gangs. Due to indoctrination, you cannot get anything from these people. The state is at a dilemma. How do you protect the larger society without getting information about future plans from the people in your custody? What's your opinion on this? Uh, you, I mean, under the law, you have to try to get the information by different ways. To security services or so. I mean, for secret services, they get the information by other ways, but not through torture. That's the point. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, so going back to the enhanced interrogation techniques the enforced by the U.S., there was a report uh, after a while that they had actually started doing that, which actually was torture. And uh, in that report, it was shown that most of the intelligence gathered through those techniques were actually faulty because you will confess to anything to, to stop someone from torturing you. And also, the second point is, uh, uh, especially in militarized and conflict situations, uh, whenever you have torture, uh, this, is, this effectively undermines the chances of any peace process or any peace discussion. That is it's in IHF. I'm talking of domestic, domestic, no, no, domestic law. law. Even in domestic law, no, what I'm saying, if, uh, if uh, Nash, I, I give you the example of my context because it's the one I know better, if uh, you have a situation in which uh, Afghan national security forces uh, torture um, uh, Taliban, suspected Taliban, convicted Taliban. Uh, do you realize how much of an obstacle this is to peace for the future? So um, I'm not actually <coughs> sure that the approach of we need to gather intelligence to protect the larger community is actually valid on any level. I uh, just wanted to share this view. Mm. So, professor, what's your opinion, sir? <laughs> I think I think torture you cannot use in any respect. It's clear, yeah. I think it's clear. for me it's clear. He's all together, banned all together, and that's it. And if this is taken under and you get information through torture, that information you cannot use in a, in, a, in a trial. Most most governments don't use the information in in the court of law. They use it for future operations. Yeah, I know, I know. But I agree with you, but I don't have, I think the state's played in what torture, they said that doesn't amount to torture. But I agree with you, I'm just saying, this is I think. In an IAC situation, so the state, can the state kill the belligerents or the Insurgents or the non state actors, or should they arrest them if they have a team? So you can. If they are combating, if they are combatants, can kill them. They take action. Yeah. But while they are combating, not if uh, they are resting the, the, uh, or sleeping the night. During the hostilities. Hmm? During the hostilities. During the hostilities. During the hostilities. During not, the not, not at the time of rest. Well, except if no, well, not at the time. When they are combating. Well, if they are directly participating in the series, but if they have continuous combat functions. Well, uh, of course, of course, but there case. must be com combatants, actually. And if they surrender, because... If they surrender, they are protected. They are immediately protected. But under what law? Under what law they protect them? Because it's, it's an AYAC. Yeah. Under human rights law? I mean, uh, the, prince, the basic principle is that you kill only when it's necessary to kill, right. and not when... Uh, uh, it's a dispute, huh? it's a dispute. There are uh, hardliners that say, it's an enemy, you can kill. No problem. Uh, but uh, one, uh, if, if one surrenders, is arrested, uh, he's not a combatant anymore. You must apply a, a rule of... Uh, of uh, detention, which is uh, does matter if it's an act, actually, which is uh, a human, humane rule. I don't think uh, you, I mean, the principle of humanity is not just uh, what is reflected uh, in the law, but it's more general principle. Actually, you should, the principle, the idea that was the base 
of the convention in, in, in um, uh, 1865 was uh, uh, to uh, reduce the suffering. And uh, what is necessary in the war, you have to kill the enemy, you kill the enemy. You can really much reduce the suffering as much as possible, or even in killing it. And if you can avoid killing, you don't kill simply. Uh, if, you, if you can uh, arrest the combatant and make a prisoner, you do that. And don't kill, and don't kill the one Once a person is a prisoner, is a prisoner. He's not combating anymore by definition. So it's, it should be protected. This is the, uh, whether the law completely reflects it, it's just different. But that would claim the customary law. <coughs> I think that, uh, I mean, when you have treaties, treaties sometimes reflect the obligation the states are ready to take in writing. But customary law, they go a bit beyond that. We heard that the um, proportionality does not apply to combatants. What is your opinion about that? The proportionality? Yes. Does not, uh, does not apply to combatants. Mm -hmm. Well, who said that? Uh, I think... Uh, <laughs> 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 no, 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 no. Well, proportionality applies um, essentially to civilians, that's correct. Okay. Uh, in the sense that in assessing you have a military target. You know that uh, uh, targeting this target, you cannot take the target only, but at least there is likelihood, at least, that you get also civilians. Maybe by chance, because the civilian that passes by. And uh, you couldn't expect it passing by, but keep up, and you can. Uh, so this would be, uh, you couldn't uh, foresee it, could be also a, a possibility. But uh, if there is likelihood that you have uh, civilian casualties, you have to apply the principle of proportionality. <coughs> that is, you have to assess which is the military advantage you have in targeting the military target if it includes the, uh, if it includes uh, the casualty of civilians. That's the proportionality. Uh, which is a difficult assessment to make in a, in a given case, perhaps. But that's what uh, the law, the law uh, would say. Under that, one can derive that if you are targeting only a military objective, and you don't kill any civilian, you don't do any civilian harm, you don't tag, you cannot uh, uh, have a collateral damage, civilian damage, you can do it. So this is why many say you can do it. There is no problem. Uh, and the combatant is a combatant. Uh, you, ca you can kill the combatant. I mean, but of course, one could say, yes, you are entitled to do that. But if instead of killing, you can arrest him, you should do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because you should apply a principle of humanity. Yeah. Uh, you, you are not prevented from killing, but if the situation is such that it's obvious to arrest him, because it's easy to arrest him. To arrest him, you pay more money, you pay more things. Uh, if I kill him, you have to kill him. He's a enemy. Yeah. <laughs> Can you make just a monetary reasoning? I don't know. That's the law. That's the law. But of course, it's, it's why, it's why uh, many, many lawyers say you can do it. It's a uh, part of this combat. Uh,
Yeah, and, uh, and possibly we'll make a, a ten-minute break uh, and come back uh, at. Uh,